so we are on um, notes 24, page 91. We're going into another way of solving the uh, downward continuation um, problem or task, if you like. Um, this is uh, by taking one of those wave equations we developed from uh, the Muir square root approximation, uh, getting us a, uh, a dispersion relation converting it to a, um, uh, at least in, in x and, uh, and z, converting it to a, uh, uh, a wave equation, a one-way uh, paraxial wave equation. And now we're going to see how to solve that numerically with finite differencing. Um, have any of you covered the topic of finite differencing before in you know, a math class or a numerical class? So. Um, um, the slow introduction that I have to it here, uh, you know, kind of following Claire Bout's book, will uh, I think uh, do well here. You know, I could skip over a lot of parts if uh, you had done finite differencing before, say to follow the, to, say to solve the heat flow equation, or something like that. All right, so um, uh, some advantages to finite different solutions of these wave equations for downward continuation. They allow velocity to vary as a function of x and z. You know, nothing, neither of those are going to be wrapped up in a uh, uh, in a Fourier transform, and so uh, we can vary uh, theoretically. We could vary x and z any way we wanted, uh, and um, although typically we will use that thin lens term from the last lecture that I that I gave, uh, which means that uh, velocity varies slowly laterally as a function of x, although it can vary rapidly as a function of z. Uh, we can have topography. We can have uneven sampling of our, of our receivers. We can have crooked lines. All of that stuff can be handled by finite differencing. Now, there is an issue. Once we develop a finite difference solution, we will see that it has a point where uh, we where it goes unstable, and we have to do a certain amount of work, a certain number of iterations, or a certain uh, number of steps uh, to avoid that instability, and that means cost. Okay, and so the way this will boil down is that cost will trade off with accuracy. Uh, well, not trade off. Uh, cost will go with accuracy. The more accuracy the more cost. The less accuracy, the less cost. Okay. Uh, the smaller the delta x, the more receivers we have, the more cost. The smaller the delta z, the more the better our depth resolution, which may or may not be warranted depending on our understanding of the velocities, uh, the more cost for better depth resolution. So we're going to set up a lot of a lot of very simple equations and finite difference them, uh, just to give you an introduction to, to how to accomplish this finite differencing um, procedure. And so we're going to solve a lot of things that are not related to wave propagation at all. Uh, or at least, uh, you know, for instance, we're going to spend a lot of time solving the heat flow equation, the one-dimensional heat flow equation, uh, and that's in lab seven as well. Uh, and, and there's a particular link. Uh, it's not going to be obvious at all at first what the heat flow equation has to do with downward continuation. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Okay. So let's take a, a, let's take a financial equation. Okay. We have a quantity of money Q, which we inflate from year to year, say from 2012 time t to 2013, which is time t plus 1. And so the, uh, and we have a rate of increase, you know, uh, and, and so my uh, rate of increase on my savings accounts anyway is uh, 0 0.00, maybe 0 0.03, uh, 0.03 percent um, per year, uh, extremely pitiful. Um, when I wrote these notes, um, you know, uh, bank account would typically get you uh, five percent uh, interest a year. Um, 
house loans were at 12 or 13 uh, percent. That's not what we've got now. So uh, Q at t plus 1 in 2013 is equal to 1 plus 0 0.0003 times Q at t, which is the quantity of money in uh, 2012. So uh, we rearrange this into an equation that is equal to 0. Okay, just to just to put things on a um, um, uh, you know just to be able to identify coefficients more uh, more consistently, and and if you if you end up in, in your uh, uh, in your lab work, um, you know with a with a change of sign for a particular coefficient, the first thing to suspect is that. Um, you know, you were supposed to have solved the equation for uh, for one of the terms, and you didn't, or you were supposed to have, you know, solved the equation for zero, put all the all the coefficients, all the terms on the same side, and have the whole equation be equal to zero, and you didn't do that. Okay, so that's the usual source for the those nagging um, sign errors that uh, creep into the algebra that we'll be doing here. So we rearrange this. We make it into an equation equal to zero. We have one times q at t plus one, plus minus one minus r times q at t is equal to zero. Okay. And of course, we could we could multiply all terms by minus one, right? We could have minus one times q at t plus one, plus uh, one plus r times q at t, and it would be the same equation, right? So uh, uh, th there are those problems too. So uh, uh, let's say we have a, a vector. I'll call it capital D. And uh, the vector has components 1 and uh, 1 minus r. I'm sorry, minus 1 minus r. And we have a, uh, uh, we have a vector q, which here contains um, uh, q at t plus 1, and then q at t. And the, uh, uh, the dot product, you know, d dot q is equal to 0. That is the same equation, right? That's the equation that we have here, OK, d dot q. So uh, you know, q at t plus 1, well, you know, I, as I said it, you know, uh, t plus 1 was uh, uh, q at uh, um, Q at 2013, maybe that's Q9. You know, nine years after I opened the account. Uh, Q at T is uh, Q at uh, 2012, maybe that's eight years after I opened the account. But of course, there's the years before, and maybe I want to predict the years after. All right, and you know, one instance of of uh, this uh, this inflation of money equation. Is the dot product, you know, for say t equals eight, right? It's the dot product of um, minus one minus r and one with the two length segment of the uh, of the q vector, which is q eight and q nine. Okay, uh, but as you can as you can see, for if this equation holds, right? I, I don't. Let's say I don't make any deposits or uh, or withdrawals. Okay, then uh, this is going to hold anywhere. Okay, for any uh, uh, for any t, right? I take uh, I take the same uh, d vector and I dot it say over here against uh, q at uh, twelve and q at thirteen, and it should uh, it should you know when I'm finished computing the dot product, I should have the same equation that's still equal to zero. Okay. So this uh, this vector, which is, uh, can you see it's kind of a uh, it's kind of a, a cross correlation or convolution filter, all right, running along this one d q vector, all right. So uh, it's like taking a long vector and and uh, cross correlating it cross correlating it with this very short d vector, okay. And and the the result of the cross correlation is always is always zero, right? So this d vector is called 
because it's what we it, it remains constant, right? Assuming the uh, uh, you know assuming we can get the value of r that we need to use for that particular year, okay? That difference that vector d uh, remains constant, and I I would like to call it a one d differencing star. Now it's not very star shaped, but when we go to two d um, convolution, you'll see why it's called a star. Okay. So uh, uh, you know, let's say uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm an auditor, and I'm picking up uh, you know just one day one year's statement of that of that uh, financial account, and all I have is Q at some year, right? So um, you know, I can obviously I can I can either backtrack or I could predict forward the Qs at any other place because I have the differencing star. Okay. So you know I can solve the equation. You know d dot q is equal to zero, and I have you know one times q at t plus one plus minus one minus r times q at t is equal to zero. Okay, and to get uh, q at t, right, uh, I can solve for I can solve uh, and and use uh, q at t plus one. Um, and uh, if if I'm missing q at t plus one like I am here, you know q at n plus one if uh, if that is is what I'm looking for, you know then uh, that would be you know minus the quantity um, minus one minus r times q at t divided by one, right? So um, that's uh, that's how we use the differencing star to find the whole series, you know, given just a little bit of data, okay. Using these kinds of, of solutions, so this is the the solution going forward from the known point. This would be the solution going back from the known point. Uh, and and okay, thinking a little bit about uh, uh, downward continuation, what's our known point? Well, that's the surface data, right? We want to downward continue it to all z. We have the surface data for all t, and we want to downward continue it to all z. Okay, so that's the known point, and then we're going to use some kind of differencing star, right? We've got to apply the star and calculate the solution for every uh, time step here, right? So it's a it's a numerical procedure, and we'll have the same thing for um, uh, the solutions uh, uh, of our downward continuation. Okay. Now uh, this is a very simple. This turns out to be a very simple finite difference solution. Right. Notice I'm not, you know, I'm not calculating anything at half years, right? And I'm not calculating monthly interest or anything like that. Um, you know, it's whatever whole t steps that I have. Um, but let's uh, uh, let's try to generalize this, okay? So um, let's generalize inflation to this uh, this equation: dQ dt is equal to r q. R times Q, so that's uh, that's essentially like uh, you know we're we're calculating that on a yearly basis by by saying you know Q at uh, t plus one minus Q at t is equal to R times Q at t. And what if I wanted to calculate you know what if I wanted t to equal the months instead of the uh, instead of the years or maybe the days? Well, then I just have to set my delta t. Okay. So what I'm really doing here, you know, this is an estimate of that derivative here. You know, it's a numerical estimate of that derivative dQ dt, and it's taken over a specified delta t, a specified uh, period. Could be monthly, could be daily, could be yearly. Okay, and and uh, let's take a look at this equation. Q at t plus one minus Q at t. Okay. Is equal to r times. And here I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, populate. Uh, I'm gonna look at the difference between terms. I'm gonna populate the, uh, uh, you know, both sides of the uh, of the equation. You know, I could make it equal to zero if I wanted to, but I have uh, r times q at t times delta t is centered. You know, the brown part, right? The term on the left is centered at t plus half. Right, because it's equally using these, uh, you know, q at t plus one and q at t, which means it's centered at t plus half. You know, as as I've been saying, t plus half a year. 
So uh, uh, the Q is centered at t plus half. Okay. Now, now the blue part on the right hand side of the equation, that's not centered at, at t plus half. It's centered at t, right? Because it uses r, which is a constant. Delta t is a constant. It's not using uh, q at t plus one. It's only using q at t. So it's centered at uh, at t. All right. So uh, let's just you know go through the this sort of academic exercise <clears throat> of um, uh, this academic exercise of uh, uh, taking the uh, centering the right hand side of the equation too, and and, and the the utility of centering and and the reason why we have to keep track of how it's centered, of how the difference is centered, how the equation is centered, that won't come out until we deal with. Uh, um, with stability, okay, and and of course that's going to have something to do with the cost of our calculations. So uh, that'll be an important consideration. All right. So let's uh, uh, let's see um, to center the right hand side of the equation. Right. I want to use q at t here, but I could just as well take the average of the values at t and t plus one. Right. So that would be q at t. Plus q at t plus one, and then I got to divide that sum by two. Take the average of those two, right? Just a just a silly numerical, uh, uh, you know, trick, right? That, that's where the delta t lies. There's the there's the left hand side of the equation, also centered at uh, t plus half, right? Now we we're gonna we're gonna let alpha absorb some of the constants, right? So alpha is going to be r times delta t over two, and uh, that'll absorb the constants and and uh, make our, our algebra simpler. So we'll have 1 minus alpha times q at t plus 1 plus minus 1 minus alpha times q at t is equal to 0, You know, making the whole thing be an equation equal to 0. Because I want to see the differencing star now, I've, I've, changed, you know, I've changed the equation and how I calculate it. You know, I've used more data, right? so it might be better, or it might not. We'll see. Um, you know, the more data points I use, the better it ought to be, right? Um, so I have d dot q equal to zero, and the differencing star now is the coefficients here, right? Uh, so I have, um, you know, if I if I right, there's the coefficients, right? Solving every, you know, putting everything in terms of the different uh, q's, the different t's, and so the differencing star is one minus alpha and minus one minus alpha. And then there's the uh, sort of a graphical representation of the differencing star. Okay, now you know in this form of the inflation of money equation, you know dQ dt equals r times q. You might have recognized a uh, first order differential equation. Okay, and um, uh, and and that's where the uh, heat flow equation comes in. Uh, we have another motivation to look at the heat flow equation. Uh, let me just take the 15 degree retarded wave equation, you know, which is uh, plenty of dip for you know anywhere in, in Texas, well except at the salt domes. Um, so uh, we have, uh, uh, if you look at the, and, and I'm dropping the primes, right? So it's a, here's the two terms of the 15 degree retarded wave equation, uh, which is d squared q dz dt is equal to minus v over two times d squared q dx squared, right? And since we're, the q instead of p is a reminder that we're you know we're in the retarded domain, so that's what another reason why to, I'm dropping the primes. Now now let's suppose uh, uh, I have a one-dimensional. Uh, okay, so so that's uh, um, uh, that's an equation we can start to uh, think about uh, finite differencing. All right, and I'm going to put up another uh, another problem here. All right, so you know what if we had uh, uh, no you know what if we had no z we weren't doing downward continuation we were just looking at a one d x t space right then this retarded equation would uh, reduce to d q d t is equal to minus v over two d squared q d x squared and that has the same form as this hopefully familiar 1D heat flow equation, okay? which is dq dt is equal to sigma over c times uh, 
d squared q dx squared. Okay, so again, I'm writing uh, partial derivatives as as subscripts, right? And um, this is a uh, this is a uh, uh, in time. This equation is um, um, is first order. It's you know it's only got first derivatives, and in space it's got second derivatives. Uh, what are these constants for heat flow? Uh, sigma uh, would be the uh, the heat transmissivity, and uh, C would be the heat heat capacity. Okay, so and you know here I'm just going to shove in those uh, those constants instead of V over two, right? Uh, just to remind you, you know these this quotient is a is a real number, and in fact it's going to be uh, greater than zero. Um, this quotient here is a real number, um, and then only after it's going to be greater than zero, but after the negative sign, it's less than zero. So they're you know they're very close in in conceptually or mathematically. Okay, I mean of course they have totally different meanings. So um, you know let's uh, this this heat flow this one D heat flow equation right? It's it's explaining heat flow you know say along a wire or through a wall in X and how the uh, the temperature say Q evolves with time T. Okay, so. Um, uh, let's uh, you know due to that due to its uh, its similarity to the fifteen degree retarded wave equation that we really want to solve. Let's study how to solve this heat flow equation. Okay, so to find a difference, we've got to find discrete expressions for the partial derivatives. All right, and and get closer to that you know q at t plus one minus q at t. Okay. Well, if you think back to the, you know, to, to Calc one in, uh, uh, you know, in high school or your freshman year in college, right? You remember that that derivatives are defined initially in a finite way, right? The definition of dQ dt is the limit as delta t goes to zero of this quotient here, which is a finite difference, right? Q at t plus delta t. Minus q at t divided by delta t, you know, scaled, normalized by, by delta t. So the uh, you know if we just drop the the limit, and we say all right, we're you know we're going to have go to a certain you know length of delta t. We're not going to go smaller than that. Okay, then we're approximating the full derivative dq dt. We're approximating it. You know here with this approximation symbol in in purple, we're approximating it. With uh, q at t plus one minus q at t divided by delta t. Now, now you can see I've got the notation all all wacky here, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, just at the top of the page here, a subscript means a uh, a derivative, and now you know a third of the way down the page, a subscript means a uh, um, it, it means an index, right? This is a you know q at a certain time index, and this is q at you know one time index back. Okay, so uh, watch out for that uh, uh, that that problem with my notation here. All right, so our finite approximation to the derivative, our finite difference, is q at t plus one minus q at t divided by delta t, and 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 you know the t plus one index means t plus 1 times delta t. If I said t plus 2, that would be t plus 2 times delta t. If I said t minus 3, that would be t minus 3 times delta t, so forth. So what about uh, the second derivative, which you know, we need to take for x, right? Um, well, that's just, that's just you know, we take the finite difference in x once, and then we take it again. Um, so we could approximate the, the second derivative, you know, d squared q dx squared. We can approximate that with, uh, 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 you know, basically this repeated finite difference. So we begin with with q at x plus two minus uh, q at x plus one divided uh, divided by delta x, and then we're subtracting from that the single finite difference q at x plus one minus q at x divided by delta x, right? 
We're subtracting those two finite differences, and then we're dividing again by delta x, right? And we got to do that, or the units won't work out, right? The the dimensional analysis has got to work out. So um, we've got q at uh, x plus two, you know, re resolving all this. We got q at x plus two minus two times q at x plus one plus q at x divided by delta x squared. Now, okay. That's our approximation to the finite difference. Now, maybe I, you know, I want to, I want to figure out, you know, what the center of that is at q, is at q at x plus one. Maybe I want it to be centered at q at x. All I have to do is shift the indices, right? I'm not, I'm not really recentering here. I'm just shifting the index so I can have a simpler, uh, simpler concept here, right? So this is, um, you know, as we'll use it from now on, it's q at x plus one minus two times q at x plus q at x minus 1 divided by delta x squared. So now it's clear that this second uh, difference is centered at uh, x. Okay. Now, I mean, we could, we could do a second time derivative uh, the same way, uh, but we did it in x because that's the one that we need for this, uh, this uh, 1D heat flow equation. Okay. So here, then, is the entire difference Equation, right? So we got uh, dQ dt, right? Single time derivative, which is approximated with. Uh, 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 now, where are we? That's a time derivative. Where are we taking it? So now I'm using a, a superscript for the x index and a subscript for the t index. Okay, these are not squares. These are not derivatives. You know they're just indices, and I got to do it uh, somehow. Eventually, we'll get to uh, objects where I have got three indices to take care of, and that's going to be a real mess on the paper. Um, but here, this is bad enough, right? So we've got um, you know we're going to take the Qs at x, and we're going to we're going to take their finite difference in time. So that's Q at x and t plus one minus Q at the same x at t. Right, divided by delta t, okay, and there's our uh, <coughs> there's our constants sigma over c, okay, times d squared uh, 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 q dx squared, and so that's uh, q at uh, now where are we taking that difference? That's going to be across x, but all at t, so that's q at x plus one and at t minus two times q at x and t plus q at x minus 1 and t over all, all, and all that over delta x squared. Now I'm going to absorb some constants here. And I think I, I forgot to uh, square it in the original notes. So we have, uh, we're going to let, uh, right, more confusion. New definite, totally new definition of alpha, right? Has nothing to do with the definition of alpha, you know, one page back. And so we'll keep doing that. You got to always got to look, you know, what are we, what are our constants? What are we? You know, what's our? Uh, what are our variables? Okay. So for the next little page or so here, uh, the alpha is going to be sigma delta t over c delta x squared. Okay. And that makes the algebra a little bit simpler. So uh, now we, uh, you know, let's let's find the differencing star. Okay. So I got to write it out as an equation equal to zero. So I've got q at uh, x and, and t plus 1 minus q, uh, q at x and t. And I'm bringing over the whole right-hand side. So I minus alpha times the quantity uh, q at x plus 1 and t minus 2 q at x and t plus q at x minus 1 and t. OK, and that's all equal to 0. And now I, I uh, you know, there's a q at x and t here, right? So I've got. Uh, Minus one times q at x and t minus uh, two or plus two alpha uh, times uh, q at x and t. So I got to combine all the like terms, right? And I got uh, what? One, two, three, four, five of them, right? Uh, no, there's only going to be four, right? So we got uh, still keeping things uh, uh, working through here. You know, we identify the coefficient of q at x and t plus one. That's the only one we've got. That's a one. The coefficient of q at x and t on the left hand that was the left hand side 
is minus 1. And the coefficient of q at uh, x plus 1 and t is minus alpha over here. The coefficient of q at x and t on, the, on this side is uh, 2 alpha. And uh, the coefficient of q at uh, uh, x minus 1 and t is minus alpha. Right? And, um, and here's, uh, you know, there's five terms there, but we see that the q at x and t, we've got to combine those. And so we end up with four terms, all equal to zero here, you know, trying to keep all the signs straight. So we have minus alpha being the coefficient of q at uh, uh, x plus 1 and t. So now I'm going to make a little grid here. And so we got x, you know, this column is x at minus 1. This column is at x. This column is at x plus 1. This row is at t. This row is at t plus 1. So the coefficient of q at, uh, at x plus 1 and t, okay, x plus 1 and t is minus alpha. We put the minus alpha in there. <coughs> the coefficient of q at uh, x and t plus 1, that's right here. That coefficient is 1. We put the 1 in there. Okay. The, uh, uh, the coefficient of q at x and t is a little more complicated. It's 2 alpha minus 1. We put the 2 alpha minus 1 in there. The coefficient of q at uh, x minus 1 and t is minus alpha. We put the minus alpha into the space there. So here is our two-dimensional differencing star. Okay? And, and you know, this is the equation that we can use to implement that as a dot product you know, within that differencing star. <clears throat> um, notice that uh, uh, you know if I have there's four terms here, right? If I have any three of them, in other words, if I have any value, any of these four, any three of these four different Q values, then I can solve for the fourth, right? I can just solve the equation. So you know whatever's missing, right? And, and it's clear, of course, I'm going to start at a known time and I'm going to evolve it to the next time, right? And I just solve. I'll solve. Be solving for q at uh, x and t plus one, and that's going to be based on you know the the values of q at t, the three values of q at t. But you know I could easily solve it to move forward in x or backwards in x as well. I could solve it if for some reason I I didn't have the center one. I could, and I had all the others. I could solve it that way. All right. So we can we can easily solve this for. Any unknown element of the star. Okay. Uh, just one thing I want to point out here about this solution, right? We, here's the here's the uh, differential equation, you know, as finite differenced. Okay. And this one, you know, this term here, this this difference, this uh, derivative is estimated by a difference that's centered at x and t plus one. This uh, second derivative in x is estimated by a derivative that is centered at, uh, at t and x. Okay, Just saying. All right? um, so it's, uh, you know, the, the two parts have different centering, okay? even though we're putting them into one equation. So we're making a, a, a solution here that's not, you know, it's not evenly centered. Okay, uh, and that, that will have some ramifications. Although this is still a useful solution. Okay, uh, all right. So let's go ahead and and resolve that difference in centering. Okay, uh, to to uh, to do that, you know, we want to center everything at q at x and t. So there's this uh, so-called leapfrog version. You know, the problem before was that uh, our time derivative was centered at t plus, uh, t plus half. I'm sorry, t plus half, not t plus 1. Okay. Um, you know, and, and uh, this is centered at x and t, right? And this is centered at x and t plus half. If we want to center the, uh, uh, if we want to center the, the time derivative also at, uh, at uh, x and t, well, we just can invoke a slightly different approximation of the time derivative. 
Okay, it's called the leapfrog version, right? It, it skips over the center element at x and t. It's uh, basically approximating dq dt by uh, q at t plus 1 minus q at t minus 1. Of course, that goes twice as far. So we've got to normalize it. We've got to divide it by 2 times delta t. Okay, that's the leapfrog uh, difference. So then we uh, plug that in and, and, uh, and we resolve it all. Okay, uh, and um, uh, and so then we uh, uh, we convert it to uh, uh, you know we we find it we have uh, f for instance the uh, uh, it's still a two D differencing star but now we gotta we gotta in include that Q at T minus one level right and we got more coefficients here. Right? We can only solve for one at a time, so we have to know four, and then we can get the one that's hanging out. Okay? So that means that uh, you know, we have to have two time levels saved to get the next one. And that'll actually have uh, some impact in the codes you're using um, you know, when you're trying to uh, convert to a uh, leapfrog difference. Um, in the code that I give you, it only saves the last t level, and you're getting the next. Here, you've got to figure out how to save, you know, two t levels um, as you're getting the next. Okay, now it's going to turn out that this leapfrog method, and you'll you'll see this, uh, it always blows up for uh, for a real um, for a real alpha. Okay, so we go to the method that is most popular. Okay, and um, that's uh, um, that's uh, everything we've looked at so far is called an, an an explicit method. Okay, you can solve this equation. You know, you can have three or four existing values, and you can solve for the fourth or fifth. Okay, um, in the implicit methods, we're going to solve for a whole next level at once. Okay, and uh, uh, we'll have to see how that's uh, how that's set up. All right, so here's uh, here's our, our simplest uh, uh, heat flow um, uh, uh, setup, finite difference setup. So we have the uh, the left side is centered at x and t plus half. So instead of you know with the leapfrog method, we we had recentered the left side at x and t uh, using the leapfrog difference. Why not recenter the right hand side? Why, you know, how do how can we make the right hand side centered at x uh, um, at, at t plus half? Well, we can uh, we can calculate the uh, we can calculate the the horizontal derivative um, twice, the second difference twice, right? So here it's calculated at t. And over here, it's calculated at t plus one, and the whole thing is going to be still is going to be now centered at x and t plus half. This is uh, kind of a famous uh, uh, method called the Crank Nicholson uh, uh, method. So these um, these uh, and it'll turn out to be implicit. I'll define you know really what implicit uh, means in a bit, um, but. Uh, uh, you know, you rearrange to get the differencing star, right? You you put all this in and you rearrange it so it equals um, it equals uh, um, uh, you rearrange it so so it equals um, uh, uh, zero. Okay, it equals zero, and then you can get the differencing star. And the process of that, uh, we're going to declare we'll have the the same alpha we've had for a page or two here. But we're going to divide it by two, and that's going to be equal to a. Okay, how's that for more confusion? Okay, um, and here is the differencing star. This is an implicit differencing star, right? And if we're going to involve, if we're, if we're going to evolve, evolve it in time from t to t plus one, you know, we're only going to have three knowns, and we have three unknowns all at once. Three knowns and three unknowns all at once. How is that going to work? Okay. Uh, 
Well, it turns out we're going to have we're going to have you know we have more than three knowns. We actually have the whole row at uh, t, and we'll find a way to solve the whole next row at t plus one all at once. Okay, but that's going to make it implicit, right? There's no way to pull out here. Well, I mean, you could do it, but it's not going to work for us to pull out just one of these new um, values and just solve for that given the other five. That actually is, is uh, less practical than solving all at once. OK? So let's set up the equations that will allow us to uh, solve it all at once, OK? The Crank-Nicholson implicit differencing star. Uh, here's uh, um, Here's, uh, now I'm going to divide up the equation in a different way. Instead of making it equal to 0, I'm going to put the t plus 1 side. These are the unknowns on the left side. And I'm going to put the knowns on the right-hand side. So the whole right-hand side, right? even though it's got q at x plus 1 and t, it's got q at x and t, it's got q at x minus 1 and t, I know all the values already at t at the previous time step. Okay? So these are all known, and I can calculate this. You know, and, and at at a certain uh, t, right, um, uh, and a certain x, then I'm going to have you know a, a series of values here, right? So for a certain uh, uh, at a certain time, I'm going to have a uh, you know one value of uh, of uh, uh, one value of uh, call it d, okay, and and these. Uh, you know, for, for different x's, right, x equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, right, I'm going to have different d's. So the number of d's I'll have depends on where I've, you know, where I'm placing the differencing star along the x vector. Okay, so I got d1 through d and x. Okay, and those are all at time t. Now to evolve to the next, uh, to t plus 1, right, uh, I've got to find all these unknowns. So uh, uh, here's, a, here's a matrix way of setting up this equation. Okay, we have this matrix T, which has got these green coefficients in it. And that's going to give us the uh, you know, multiplying T times the unknowns, which are at, that's Q at T plus 1. right? Those are the ones in purple okay, on the left-hand side of the, of the equal sign. And that's you know, for... Uh, uh, you know, if x is equal to one, then that's for x at two, x equal to two, x equal to one, x equal to minus, x equal to zero, right? Uh, for x equals equal to fifteen hundred, right? That's x. That's fifteen hundred one. X equal to fifteen hundred. X equal to four, uh, fourteen ninety nine. So forth. Okay. So really, what the the matrix multiplication is doing is it's it's giving you the calculation. You know, every Every time you take this column vector of unknowns here and dot product it with the uh, with a row, that's solving the equation at a different x value, okay, and and that's going to be equal to this known d. You you can pre-calculate all the d's, okay. Uh, this uh, these coefficients, right? I mean, we we don't have x plus fifteen. We don't have x minus twenty. There's only three values uh, that that are involved in the dot product for any given x, right? And uh, this one here, this one plus two a, one plus two a, that's along the diagonal, okay? And there's a side diagonal uh, which is uh, minus a, and there's another side diagonal on the other side which is minus a. So um, this is a uh, what we call a tri-diagonal matrix. Um, it's got these uh, symmetric diagonals, right? Which have to be that's, there has to be an odd number of them, and uh, and there's three, right? So we have one plus two a along the proper diagonal, and along one side diagonal we have minus a, and we also have minus a along the other side diagonal. That's how that's kind of the terminology that I'll that I'll use, and and uh, so I call the matrix T for tridiagonal, and uh, you know, I can put anything I want along these diagonals. You know, I can with x I can alter a, which means I can alter the uh, the heat flow properties, right? Because a involves alpha, which in all involves the heat flow properties, 
Okay, it involves delta x, and and so I can you know I can still pursue this calculation even though I have different you know maybe I have different values of a here. So I'm going to make each diagonal in each side diagonal a vector. Okay, the first uh, the leftmost uh, side diagonal is a. The actual diagonal is b, the b vector, and the uh, upper side diagonal is the c vector. Okay. And each one is a each one is a vector, and and uh, first we're going to work on having you know all identical uh, uh, elements in each uh, in each uh, diagonal, okay, and side diagonal. And here we have a is equal to c, uh, and a and c are just equal to minus a, okay, and then b you know is basically all one plus two a, except at at its ends, okay. You know, b is a little, is one one times longer than than the side diagonals, and uh, and and we might need something special at the left hand side and the right hand side. Okay. Uh, so so you know, solving the matrix, the tridiagonal matrix T, means then to solve the system for the Q's at the next time, right? We're given the the known d's, you know, which is the right-hand side of the equation at the uh, uh, at the known uh, at the known time step, and we're going to solve this system. We're going to invert this tridiagonal matrix, and and be able to solve for the q's at t plus one. Okay. Um, let's see. So that's the um, that's that the d values the knowns at t. That's the upper half of the star. Okay. And the tridiagonal matrix is the uh, the lower half of the star, as you can see. And there's a you know I made a sign error right in there, um, so hopefully that's two uh, a plus one on yours as well. Uh, okay, so I think I think I should. Uh, it turns out uh, you know matrix inversion uh, in general is a is a nasty proposition, right? Um, I mean there are uh, there are, you know, prepackaged ways to do it. They're fairly easy to use, uh, but they're not going to work very well for very large data sets, okay? Or when applied repeatedly, as we're going to have to. Uh, and and one of my colleagues uh, at Penn State uh, back in like 1960, he figured out how to solve a a tridiagonal matrix like this really easily, really fast, and we're going to use that. And I'll show it to you uh, tomorrow. Um, it's a, it's really a, a a very intuitive and brilliant solution, kind of heuristic. Um, it's it's purely numerical. There's there's no you know the physics is in the uh, is in the differencing star. The physics is in the uh, um, the uh, uh, the differential equations. Uh, there's no physics used in the solution of the tridiagonal system. It's a it's a purely mathematical exercise. And uh, but as you might imagine, it's the special limited structure of these tridiagonal matrices that makes them, you know, so easy to invert. Okay, so I'll leave it at that, and I'll show you the, this brilliant solution of Roy Greenfield's um, uh, uh, tomorrow. All right, so we're in notes twenty-four, and we're all the way down at the uh, the method for solving the tridiagonal matrix at uh, page 98, uh, about uh, 3 quarters of the way through, notes 24. Um, last time I ended with setting up, uh, let's see, we have the simple, um, we have the simple heat flow equation. Um, and where is it? Right there. Simple heat flow equation, dq dt is equal to sigma over c times d squared q dx squared. And we, are sol we solve that uh, first with a, uh, the most obvious uh, finite differencing. That gives the Crank-Nicholson explicit method. Uh, we checked out the, uh, uh, the leapfrog um, difference for the um, uh, for solving that, uh, in uh, for solving the the time derivative, uh, that requires saving uh, two pre previous steps in time, uh, and here's a differencing star for that. And then we started to work on the uh, 
implicit method where we get everything centered in the same place by repeating the uh, the second x difference twice, you know, once at at t and once at t plus one, so that the right hand side of the uh, of the equation is centered at the same place as the left hand side at t plus half and x. Here's the uh, six element differencing star. And then thinking about the application of that across you know, many different values of x or many different x positions, you know, where there's more than just three, um, three different x positions. You know, usually, we might have 100 or 1,000 or 20,000. Thinking about that, we set up this uh, tridiagonal solution. Um, so here's the uh, difference equation at the top of the screen, which has uh, uh, been arranged so that we have all of the t plus one elements, which are the unknowns, since we're going to, you know, we're evolving the heat equation in time, right? Um, we want to see the diffusion of temperature uh, in this one-dimensional world. So uh, the t plus 1 q's are on the left. The t that we already know from the previous and known level, uh, those q's are on the right. So we create a, uh, a matrix equation out of this that solves for all of the, uh, uh, all of the q's at all the different uh, um, x positions at t plus 1 all at once. And it's in terms of. Um, you know that that unknown in purple. So the column vector of unknowns is uh, is in purple. Uh, you multiply that column vector by this tridiagonal matrix. That accomplishes the uh, multiplications by these coefficients minus a, one plus two a, and minus a again. Um, and notice there's no uh, you know x minus fifteen or x plus two. So um, that matrix is fairly simple. It's not quite like a diagonal matrix, but it just has uh, two side diagonals. It's, and it's symmetrical. So it's got this very simple form, and, and here are the values that it has. And you can, you can vary those values uh, to recognize changes in velocity or spacing, you know, delta x, delta t, if you need to. Um, and so uh, multiplying that, that you know the right-hand side of the equation is a, is accomplished by multiplying this tridiagonal matrix by uh, uh, q at t plus one, which is the unknowns, and that's equal to the knowns, which you know this whole right-hand side is summed up into you know d at x equals one, d at x equals two, and so forth. Those are all on the right-hand side from uh, the known level t. Okay, we'll talk about uh, the three. Diagonals of the uh, of the tridiagonal matrix being these three vectors a, b, c. B is the actual diagonal of the matrix. Okay, and here's what they are. Uh, we'll see later why we need to break out the uh, uh, the left and right ends, perhaps, uh, of the of the diagonal. Um, and then um, uh, uh, so the the task now is to uh, invert and solve this system, invert the tridiagonal matrix, and, um, uh, and actually get the unknowns in purple at the next time level. So back about 1960, uh, uh, Roy Greenfield, who was my colleague at Penn State many years ago, um, he came up with this uh, kind of very heuristic and, and you know, completely uh, numerical solution. No physics here. Um, so uh, we're going to express the uh, the difference equation, um, which is uh, back up here. We're going to express that in terms of uh, three vectors. Okay, we've got uh, the A, B, C, which are the uh, the diagonal and side diagonals of the tridiagonal matrix, and then we have D. Okay, that's a fourth vector. That's the knowns. Okay, so we have uh, four vectors. Okay. And the superscripts here on the vectors, those are the x locations. Okay, they're not powers; they're just they're just indices, and they're indices in x, which is why I've left them as superscripts. So a at uh, x equals j uh, times uh, q at, at uh, x equals j plus one uh, plus uh, b at j 
times q at j plus c at j times q at j minus 1 is equal to d at j. Okay? So that's, uh, uh, that's uh, you know, basically a way of carrying forward the whole forward calculation. Okay? Now, um, and of course, what we want to do is we want to get uh, q at j. We want to get q at j plus 1. We want to get q at j minus 1. In fact, we want to get all the q's. Right? And these are all q's at, at time t plus 1. You know, they're the unknowns. The, the, the knowns, they're all buried back here in the d's. We're not going to worry about them. Okay? And, and how Roy came up with this method, I, I have no idea. I'm, I'm not that intelligent. Uh, this is one of those flashes of genius um, that, um, uh, that I have very little experience with. Okay? So uh, and, and maybe maybe th there's a similarity here. You know, if you you could go through and, and uh, do all of the uh, what is it called Euler substitution to uh, to solve the to invert the matrix. Okay, and, and maybe he he started doing that and he noticed that there was a simple pattern that developed. You know, in the in the process of, of doing the Euler substitution with a, a matrix as simple as the uh, as the tridiagonal matrix. So what he does is, is this. He, he introduces two, two new vectors, e and f. Right? We got a, b, c, d. Right? So he's going to introduce e and f. Uh, just like a, b, c, and d, they are nx long. Okay? And, and we're going um, to let the following be true. Okay? q at j, which is position j, is equal to uh, the scratch vector e at j, whatever that is. Okay, times uh, the next um, the next value of q at at the the next door location j plus one plus f at j. Okay, and, and really this is like uh, uh, this is very much like the, the kind of solution you see um, in the. Uh, This is very much like the, the kind of solution you see uh, in the statistical model, where, you, where basically you have uh, these uh, correlation coefficients. And you can, you know, if you have enough coefficients, you can make any time series, right? And that's all this is doing. I mean, this, this happens to be a, a spatial series in X um, for this, but, uh, uh, you know, it's still a one dimensional series, right? The Q's. You know, they start at j equals one, and they go up to j equals n x, right? Um, and and so here is a, you know, if 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 we but knew, you know, what uh, e at every j was and what f at every j was, then we could easily say, all right, you know, we have a different uh, e and f, and with those we can create q at j from q at j plus one, and then work our way back, right? Um, Okay, so let's shift the index now. We'll just subtract one from all the x indices. So q at j minus one is equal to e at j minus one times q at j plus f at j minus one. And then, um, and, and this is where the, the flash of brilliance must have happened. Um, he realized that you could you could get somewhere by substituting four into two. Okay, and I guess it's the simple structure. You know, the fact that that there's only only three terms uh, and three unknowns in two in this equation two. I think that's that's the the, the brilliance there. Uh, I mean, because if you if you had a general you know matrix where you had uh, you know maybe five hundred terms here on each row, right? You know, if your row is isn't mostly populated by zeros, right? Like tridiagonal matrix is mostly zero, right? But if you uh, if the row had five hundred terms that were non-zero, you know, doing the substitution would get you nowhere. Just a whole bunch of, of nasty algebra, right? And nothing would simplify. But he realized you could substitute in, you know, four into two. Okay. So what we've got here is then uh, a at a at j times q at j plus one plus b at j times q at j uh, plus um, uh, c at j times, and instead of q at j minus 1, we have uh, e, we substitute in 4, and we have uh, 
uh, e at j minus 1 times q at j plus f at j minus 1. And of course, that's all equal to d at j. And we rearrange this to look like uh, uh, number 3, to look like the definition of the scratch vector. right? So uh, you know, we've got uh, uh, q at j out here on the left side. Of course, that has to be uh, multiplied by b at j plus c at j times e at j minus 1. Now, 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 you know, OK, and then that equal, that's equal to, uh, uh, let's see, we have uh, a at j times q at j minus 1. Uh, I'm sorry, q at j plus 1, OK, plus d at j minus c at j times f at j minus 1. And uh, uh, so, so then, uh, you know, number 6 here, is it all arranged to look like Number three, q at j is equal to, uh, you know, minus a at j time, uh, over b at j plus c at j times e at j minus one, okay, uh, times q at j plus one, okay. So there's that parallel there, and then we want to add, uh, you know, we want to make it look like we're adding f at j, okay. So we're going to add d at j minus uh, c at j times f at j minus one over the quantity b at j plus c at j times e at j minus one. Okay, so you you know then just compare these right, and uh, all right. So now suddenly we have a definition for e and f. Okay, e at j is equal to minus a at j divided by b at j plus c at j times e at j minus one, and f at j is equal to d at j minus c at j times f at j minus 1 um, over b at j times c at j times e at j minus 1. Now, now let's examine this solution. You know, the, the solution for f at j, I mean, that involves e at j. So first, we've got we to gotta find the e at j, right? And, um, uh, and let's see what we got here. Uh, and this is uh, you know, where, his brilliance, where, where Roy's brilliance was uh, confirmed. Um, e at j is equal to minus a at j. Well, we know what the a's are. You know, those are those are preset. That's not an unknown. Uh, same with the b's. We know what the b's are. We know what the c's are. The only thing we don't know in here is e at j minus one. So if we knew e at one, right, we could start off and we get all the e's at all the rest of the j's just by you know uh, leapfrogging up, right? We we we. Somehow we take a guess at e at j minus 1, and that gives us e at 1. Then we have e at 1, and we can get e at 2, and so forth. Go all the way to the right-hand side of the, of, the, uh, of the migration. Or, I'm sorry, of the uh, right-hand side of the, of, the, um, of the refrigerator wall, you know, the, uh, the heat flow problem. Uh, and then we've got all the e's, right? And so we, 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 can, we have whatever e we need in here. And then, OK, in the equation for f at j, that requires d. We know that. c, b, c again. We know those. e we just found. OK. And so if we could somehow get f at 1, at x equals 1, right, then we could get f at x equals 2, and so forth. OK. Or you know, I like to use uh, c indices. So if we could just get f at zero, at x equals zero, then we could get f at, at x equals one, and all the f's uh, throughout. So what these are are you know they're called recursion formulas that find the vectors e and f from the known a, b, c, and d. Okay, and uh, okay, so and then we can. You know, then we can go back to number three. Once we have e and f, we go back to number three, and we we get uh, all the q's. Okay. Again, we you know the q is a is a is gotten with a recursion formula, except we have to somehow we got to figure out what q at n x is, and then we can get q at n x minus one. Okay. Uh, so that's a recursion formula for uh, for the q's for the unknowns. And then we're done, okay. And and all we've done is is we have one loop that goes through and gets uh, you know it go it's uh, we have a loop that goes through and gets the e's from zero, okay. So that's n x operations, and then we uh, we have a loop that goes through and gets the f's n x operations, 
and then one more uh, set of NX operations to start at the right-hand side and get the Qs. That's it. Three times NX. That's like, practically no calculation at all. OK? Um, absolutely brilliant. OK? Um, all right. So, so, and I should have, I should have you know, drawn a real thick line here. Um, OK, so how do we find E1 and F1? Right? Because that's going to control the whole thing. How do we find E1 and F1? OK? So uh, now, now notice, again, these are superscripts. These are not, there's no squares in here. OK? Uh, and, and that's all carried through down here. All right? Um, you know, we got to start somewhere. Um, from uh, equation three, which is, uh, OK, that's the, the uh, recursion for the, for the Qs, for the actual solution. OK? Q at 1 is equal to E at 1 times Q at 2 plus F at 1. OK? So uh, really, E1 and F1, uh, what those are going to be, that gets determined by the relationship at the, between the Qs at the edge. And so now let's bring some physics into this and figure out what that should be. OK? Um, and, and remember, we're still working on the heat flow problem here. Okay, so um, E one and F one are determined by the lateral boundary conditions on Q. You know, at the edges, you know, at the first x and the last x. Okay, so we're talking about the sides. You know, the limits of our of our uh, uh, of our heat flow calculation, our one dimensional heat flow calculation. Okay. Now, zero boundary, okay, means that Q1, you know, at the edge would be zero. All right. Now, now in terms of heat flow, what does that mean? That means that, uh, you know, let's say our 1D problem is like through the wall of the of your refrigerator, okay, and um, or or through a window. All right. So if uh, if it's a really cold day outside. And uh, outside the, the, the window, you know, on the left side of your calculation, outside the window, it's uh, you know like minus forty degrees. Okay, that is a perfect refrigerator, right? So that would be you know a zero boundary, right? We're going to take the temperature basically to zero. We got a perfect refrigerator on the outside of the window, and uh, and and uh, that's a so we can set. Uh, a zero boundary. We want Q1 to be equal to zero. Okay. So uh, then, you know, by this relationship, that means E1 times Q2 is equal to minus F1. But uh, also, um, you know, from the uh, difference equation, Q2, Q at two is equal to D at two. All right. So uh, that means that E at one times D at two is equal to minus uh, F at one. So, so here's a you know here's a relationship that has to be obeyed, and you know any numbers you put in here that uh, that then give you uh, you know they're they're going to give you that zero boundary, and so you've got some latitude, uh, you know it's it's like the ratio between uh, you know minus f one over e one has to be d two, you know so it's just the ratio is defined and and the exact value well you can you can fudge that in as long as it obeys the ratio, okay. Now, now uh, what if you're going through, uh, you're looking at the, the wall of your refrigerator, OK? So you've got a low temperature inside, not zero, but a low temperature. And then you know, you've got all this insulation. So that means once you get into the insulation, right, the insulation is supposed to stop any heat flow. How do you stop heat flow? You don't have any temperature differences. If there's no temperature difference, then heat doesn't flow, right? So what insulation does is it, that means that that the temperature at the boundary is exactly the same as the temperature next to the boundary. Okay, no heat flow. So that's a zero slope boundary, perfect insulator. Okay, perfect insulator means you have zero slope to Q at the at the edge. So that has to mean then that for a zero slope boundary, Q at one equals Q at two. Okay, not Q squared. All right, and Q at one then times uh, the quantity one minus E at one. Is equal to f at one, but also 
you know, from uh, uh, number two, equation two, the, the difference equation, you've got q at one is equal to d at one times, I'm sorry, d at one divided by the quantity a at one plus b at one. Okay, so then you get uh, f at one is equal to d at one over the quantity a at one plus b at one times uh, uh, the quantity one minus e at one. All right. So again, it's it's a you know ratio relationship, and as long as you make it work, then uh, 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 you could put uh, a variety of different values in there. All right. You don't want to put in something you know. I mean, of course, you put in zeros for e and f. And and it will work, right? Uh, the ratios will work, but but that's a you know that's a degenerate solution to it. You want to put in a, some some you know real value. Okay, so you know by setting up the left boundary condition, we can use then seven and eight, right? The uh, recursion formulas to get E and F, <clears throat> and then uh, four uh, up here. Um, you know this recursion formula gets us the unknowns. Okay, just to to recap that uh, once more. So so you know that uh, um, okay that gives us the right boundary condition and th and then we have to def you know so we're doing two things where the left boundary condition gives us uh, the relationship between e one uh, gives us e one and f one. Okay. The right boundary condition, we, we go directly to uh, <coughs> the relationship between uh, uh, q at n at q at and q at n minus one. Okay, this is q at n x on the right hand side. So for zero boundary, we want q at n x to be equal to zero. Uh, and then here's the uh, <coughs> here's the uh, uh, the difference equation on the right hand side. You know, which is uh, c at n minus one times q at n minus one plus you know the right hand uh, part of the the right hand element of the diag of the diagonal of the uh, of the um, tridiagonal matrix times uh, q at at n uh, or n x is equal to d at n. Okay. So uh, for a zero boundary again, and and possibly not necessarily, but possibly we'll we'll use the same boundary condition on on the right side as we use on the left side. Okay. And if you want a zero boundary condition. Then q at n has got to be equal to zero. <clears throat> so q at n minus one, then uh, you know from the difference equation, has got to be d at n divided by c at n minus one. Okay, uh, simple enough. And uh, for the zero slope boundary, q at n is equal to q at n minus one. So q at n uh, then is equal to d at n divided by c at n minus one plus that that right. And um, you know this this right hand element of uh, you know which is really a b right that's b at n um, that's uh, what you can you can also use that as a toggle to make sure that q at uh, to make sure this ratio is observed so we have the value of uh, q at n and then we can using number four we can compute back to q at n minus one q at n minus two and all the way to q at uh, n equals uh, one. So this is exactly the approach take that uh, the extrapolation program that you'll see in uh, in lab eight takes. Uh, that's really, I think, uh, uh, you know, kind of the essential exercise uh, for this half of the class that I'd I'd like you to get to. Uh, that's on page uh, one hundred five of the book. Uh, it's in lab eight. Uh, you know, it's extrap.java uh, in your uh, in your lab exercise. Um, and this extrapolation is essentially doing downward continuation. It's it's using downgoing waves just for illustrative purposes. So, you know, you have to change a sign to use it for upgoing waves for migration. But uh, everything else is the same. Um, and um, uh, we actually uh, we actually uh, you know we've been talking about heat flow, but we take the uh, uh, we we make the the extrapolation equation look very much like uh, the heat flow equation by taking the the data into the omega domain, okay, and the extrapolation takes place in steps of z instead of t across x, okay, same x, but uh, we're we're going to substitute uh, everywhere we see uh, time t here, 
and and of course what we've been talking about is how to evolve it in time. We're going to evolve it in z instead. Okay, the, and the time axis will be taken care of in the frequency domain. So the different thing star is the same shape. Okay, and uh, uh, the reason that is is because both the 15 degree and you know when you get to it the 45 degree equations, there's never more than a second x derivative, and there's never more than a first z derivative. Okay, uh, so the um, uh, you know you need three side by side elements in the star for the uh, for the second x derivative, and you need two, uh, you know, you need two elements on top of each other in z for the z, the single z derivative. Okay. Now with uh, q being complex, okay, right? Uh, once we're in the frequency domain, right, we've transformed into omega, right? Instead of q being a real temperature, it's going to be complex. It's going to be a, a complex uh, wave component. So the tridiagonal tri matrix is going to be complex too, and the solution of the system is complex. But you know, other than you know, so all this math is not going to be real. It's going to be done in in complex. Um, but I give you a, a comp. You know, ctries.java is a uh, is a is a tridiagonal matrix uh, solver for uh, for complex numbers. Okay. 